So welcome everyone to the IGF's uh, webinar looking at improving legal frameworks for ESA and management. Um, we're going to have a really great session. I hope you're, hope you're excited for it. So just a little bit of background on, on uh, who the speakers will be before I get into the agenda. My name is Craig Radford. I'm the director of the uh, IGF, as we like to call it, the long name, the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining, Minerals, Metals, and Sustainable Development. So you can see why we, we go by IGF. Uh, we're excited to uh, talk about our guidance document. We're also uh, excited to have other speakers from um, partner organizations that are working in this field. My colleague, uh, Clemence, is uh, one of our uh, key legal advisors and one, our outreach manager within uh, the IGF. And uh, she'll be uh, speaking first and providing a, a background on the guidance document. Uh, we also have uh, uh, Paula, she's, she's uh, the technical secretary at the Netherlands Commission for Environmental Assessment. She joined uh, last year, I think, Paula, and with, she brought she brings with her 25 years of experience to NCEA, and she's the uh, focal point and lead for mining at the NCEA. And then lastly, uh, we have uh, Harriet, who's the program coordinator and uh, the policy, legal, and institutional framework at Transparency International, and uh, Paula, or sorry, Harriet is based in uh, Kenya. And I'll talk about a um, uh, little bit of background uh, in a minute about the role that the NCA and Transparency International played in the development of our guidance document. So just overview in terms of the agenda. Um, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll provide some background in terms of the guidance document and, and, what, uh, and how it came about and, and what we are trying to accomplish with the guidance document. Uh, my colleague Clemence will, will provide a little more details in terms of the content, as I mentioned, and exactly what the uh, what the what 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 the legal framework uh, looks like. And then um, I'll, we'll hand it over to uh, Paula at NCAA, who will will provide a, a a summary of the role that NCAA played in terms of providing um, an independent review of our guidance document. Uh, we were they were they were kind to undertake. Quite, a, quite, an, quite an extensive and comprehensive review where they had a team looking at it and they, and they did that independently and provided their report uh, publicly. So we're, we're excited to hear more details about that. And as well, Transparency International, uh, Harriet uh, will present uh, some of their um, feedback on, uh, in terms of the transparency and accountability aspects of not just the guidance document, but also uh, the role of transparency and accountability within environmental social impact assessment. And as I mentioned, we're really hoping for a pretty robust uh, discussion uh, in Q&A. So speaking of that, on the bottom of your screen, uh, you'll see the Q&A uh, uh, function. So what we're hoping is that if everyone kind of sends their questions uh, as our speakers are, are talking into the Q&A box, then we will uh, co we'll collect those. Uh, um, my colleague Jennifer Hill will, will help help me with that, and we will um, kind of answer those questions after after the speakers. So, as, as any questions come up as you're listening to the speakers, please put them in the uh, Q and A box, and then we'll collect those, and then we'll have uh, hopefully a really great robust discussion. Given the participants from all over the world, we've got over 90 participants so far. Um, I think our discussion will be absolutely. Uh, will be excellent. I'm really looking forward to that. So I'll just very quickly, uh, for those that aren't as familiar with the IGF, uh, the Intergovernmental Forum, um, its members are governments. We currently have 76 governments that are members of the IGF. Uh, we have an executive committee of, of members that uh, represent regions. So we have six executive committees that, that re represent the various regions. And then we have the secretariat um, uh, which, which I head and is based in uh, Ottawa, Canada, and the Secretariat is hosted by the International Institute for Sustainable Development. So the IGF has been around for over 15 years. We're just about to host our 16th annual annual general meeting. And uh, just a heads up that we'll, we'll be sending a, a save the date out to everyone soon. The, uh, I just announced that the annual general meeting will be October 20th to 22nd, and this will be our very first virtual AGM. Uh, so please stay tuned for that, uh, for that information. So one of the things uh, that the IGF does as part of promoting sustainable development in the, 
in the mining sector, which is the core uh, focus of, of the IGF as an intergovernmental forum. It's to promote dialogue and best practices for governments in the mining sector and sustainable development. The IGF created uh, what is called a mining policy framework, which, which sets out kind of the, the policy recommendations that governments should adhere to when they're developing their policies, laws, and regulations uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding the, the mining sector. And as part of that kind of policy framework, the IGF has been working on a series of guidance documents. Uh, our first guidance document was on artisanal and small-scale mining. So the, the, the title was uh, ASM management, no, sorry, managing ASM. We've also developed guidance documents related to local content policies, uh, base erosion and profit shifting, looking at tax implications. And we're currently working on a guidance document on environmental management, and that'll be out later this year for everybody. That'll focus on topics such as water, biodiversity, um, uh, waste management, and emergency preparedness and response. And then the document we're talking about today comes out of that, comes out, comes uh, from that as well. So just, I'll take literally two minutes more just to talk about kind of the overview of the guidance document. Uh, you see the, the cover page there. It's on the IGF website. It's, it's available to everyone. And this is what we'll be uh, focused on um, today. All right. So really uh, high level, um, our guidance documents, as I mentioned, help governments uh, implement our mining policy framework. So what are the laws, regulations, policies the government should be enacting um, to ensure international good practice within the mining sector within their countries? And what's unique about the IGF and our guidance documents is that they are really focused on uh, what is the role of the governments. So if in the area of environmental social impact assessment, for example, there's all kinds of uh, good practice out there in terms of what impact assessment uh, should be, what what companies uh, should be develop should be doing, and the, the components and contents of environmental social impact assessment. So what we what we decided what our members uh, had asked for was support in what what does a good legal framework of the SIA. So we're we're not as much focused on the exact content details so you can go to IIA or other organizations for for the content but what does a good uh, legal framework look like um, because as, as you can imagine a legal framework if you have a really strong robust legal framework you're going to uh, have greater success and better outcomes in terms of managing uh, environmental social issues so that's what we were trying to focus on um, and it, one of the things that came out as well is the importance of environmental and social management plans uh, in that legal framework. So that was included as well. As well as uh, looking at the process of granting permits and, permits and negotiating mining contracts. Um, so mining contracts often uh, for large scale mines play an important uh, role in uh, supplementing the, the legal requirements imposed on projects in addition to the ESIA and legal requirements. One thing to keep in mind is that uh, for this guidance document, uh, really the focus is on environmental social impact assessment at the project level, and, it, and we are focused more on large scale uh, mining. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have a guidance document on art managing artisanal small scale mining. So this document really focuses more on large scale mining. And I'd just like to uh, just thank uh, our organizations that have helped out with us. Uh, International Association for Impact Assessment, IIA, helped uh, undertake uh, kind of peer review with their membership. Same with their, our uh, Frank, with IIA sister organization, CIFE. Uh, they, they played a very active role. Um, as I mentioned, Netherlands Commission for Environmental Assessment, and Paula will be talking about uh, their role uh, soon. Uh, as well as Transparency International uh, provide a, provided uh, feedback. We had a we had a open consultation process, a public online co consultation process. Um, in addition, we had uh, multiple engagement with our members um, at, during our annual general meetings in 2018 and 2019. So this has been a uh, multi-year process coming up to the development of this guidance document. We uh, consulted uh, very quite broadly with a lot of different organizations. As I mentioned, we had a, we had a public online. Um, we also had uh, support, I should say, uh, from the government of Canada, who helped uh, who helps fund our secretariat, 
well as the government of Germany who uh, provided support to the, to the development of this guidance document. So lastly, I just want to mention before I hand it over to Clemence is that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this, was, this was two years in the making. Uh, and as part of our, our extensive research, we were looking, we, we did research over uh, 55 countries around the world in terms of what their legal framework looked like. So I'm going to pass it over to Clemence to, to get into a little more detail uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the guidance document uh, before we hand it over to uh, Paula and then over to Harriet. Clemence? Thank you, Greg. Good morning. On behalf of the drafting team, Susie Nichema, Christy Disney, Jennifer Hill, Jean Baker, Carolina Lissinger, and so and much more, uh, I'm pleased to be introducing you uh, to the guidance document in more detail this morning. As Greg noted, the guidance is the result of extensive research and consultation on best practices for ESE legal frameworks in the mining sector. Uh, the outcome is this you know, two years research is this rich and comprehensive document, which I hope some of you have had a chance to read before this webinar. It's almost an impossible task for me to present you all of the good practices and recommendations contained in the guidance document in 10 minutes or so. However, I will do my best. So let's start by briefly discussing the broader future uh, of the guidance document, which is in the previous slide. The guidance document covers a wide range of ESA issues in mining and provides a compendium of best practices, as Greg mentioned, to strategies for governments, but also for industry and civil society stakeholders interested in improving the ESA governance in the mining sector in their jurisdictions. Uh, the, gu the guidance is organized into four sections, each with a dedicated purpose. For instance, to make the guidance accessible to a larger audience of professionals and non-professionals. We started by helping the reader understand the key concepts and steps of ESA processes in the mining sector. So if you are not an ESA expert in the mining sector, section A of this guidance document will help you familiarize yourself with all the issues we dealt with in the guidance document. Section B that you see in this diagram is intended to be one of the most important sections of the guidance document as it provides a sort of model for a good and comprehensive legal framework for ESAA and management in mining. We have identified and discussed 20 components of such a framework, but with an understanding that countries have their unique circumstances and will need to adapt and adjust these recommendations in light of their own experiences. Section C in this diagram is one of the larger sections of the guidance document. It presents recommended key government actions during the entire life cycle of the mine from exploration to mine closure. Each chapter in this section corresponds to a specific steps of an ESA process within the timeline of a mining project. You see section D which presents strategies and tools to improve legal frameworks in practice, including a detailed list of assessment questions in chapter 10. This is really an important tool for countries who need to undertake a gap analysis to understand how to incorporate all the recommendations provided in this guidance document. The annex is also an interesting uh, resource because it provides additional uh, tools such as key definitions, a reading list, a discussion of key mining issues that could not have been developed further in the limited space of this guidance document. All the interesting features of the guidance include legal dispute case studies, an example of provisions that confirm the importance of some of the proposed recommendations. Now, in the next slide, let's focus on the key recommendation for a comprehensive legal framework for ESA and management plan for the mining sector. As Greg mentioned, again, we have had a chance to benefit from consultation and contribution from experts, some of which are with us today. This has enabled us to, as I mentioned previously, to identify 20 components of a comprehensive legal framework for ESA and management plans that actually can help government ensure a greater environmental protection and social protection for the communities while at the same time provide clarity and predictability to investors. The 20 component can be regrouped on in 10 themes as you can see, but 
We will only cover a handful today due to time constraint, but I hope that you will have a chance to read the executive summary that explain in more detail these components. So we start with a commitment to sustainable development. We believe that a good legal framework is one that translates a vision for sustainable development into legal requirement, for instance, by enhancing environmental and economic and social protection on, in certain situations. For example, this might imply having a clear vision on when, where, and on which conditions mining can and cannot take place in a given jurisdiction. Uh, you will see also in this slide that we identify coordination as a critical component of a comprehensive legal framework. Coordination in a sense of ensuring an harmonious and interactions between laws governing ESA processes, but also between government agency. For example, responsible authorities, along with their responsive roles in review, decision making and monitoring processes are clearly identified in the good legal framework. We also identify, as you can see, coverage of all phases of a mine life cycle. We believe that a good legal framework ensures that social and environmental requirements are defined for all phases of the mine life cycle, commensurate with the risk of the activity. For example, as you know, different phases and type of mining activities have different environmental and social impacts. Therefore, it's critical to avoid a gap in addressing and managing throughout the mine life cycle, including in the exploration phase, which is currently less regulated in many jurisdictions we study. Our colleague from NCA, for example, will explain more on this topic. For large-scale mining activity, we pose that a non-biased review and resulting license or certificate or approval are conditions for granting a large mining scale mining activity. We also discuss, as you can see in this slide, the issue of public engagement, consultation, and transparency. In the guidance document, we reiterated the importance of meaningful engagement and consultation, including consultation of, of indigenous people and taking into account their rights. We also highlighted that this meaningful consultation and engagement should happen early on in the ESA process and in the mine life cycle. And this should also include building the capacity of stakeholders for an effective participation. In a comprehensive legal framework, requirement for guideline regarding transparency and access to information and social information are also provided. The guidance had established, for example, that information regarding proposed and ongoing projects, their potential effect on the environmental and social potential social disruption and related mitigation are key in achieving public and stakeholder trust. Therefore, it's really important to make sure that access to information is provided and warranty for all stakeholders. We discuss here, for example, conditions around consultation formats, language to be used, location that will be able to ensure the greater access to information and ensure an effective stakeholder participation. And lastly, we also discuss topics related to procedural, legal oversight and financial transparency and how this can be translated throughout the life of the mine. Since we have a chance today to have an expert on transparency, uh, I, will, I will stop here and we will be having um, our colleague Harriet share her experience and feedback on the guidance document on this issue and also the work that they've been doing on the ground. The intent uh, of this slide is to show you how the guidance document actually translates the component, the 20 components, into concrete government action throughout the different steps of an ESAA process within the timeline of a mine project. You will see that the chapters are color coded to help you navigate the document. For example, here in this slide, the orange screening process through exploration. We have provided steps that government can undertake to determine when a proposed mine needs a full ESAA or related and related government review or not. Uh, in the yellow, 
uh, uh, color coded chapter, which is about mind planning. We provided key government action also during this phase. We had had a lengthy discussion about how government can actually and concretely uh, build this stakeholder capacity that I've talked briefly um, in the previous slide to ensure an effective participation. We also discussed how to ensure greater transparency in practice and what consideration government can take into account in the decision to approve or deny environmental authorization for a mine project, for example. We also provided, you will see the blue um, chapter, we also provided key government actions regarding their monitoring, inspection, and enforcement roles in the construction and operation phases. So the same goes for mine clo closure planning, which we all know start actually at the mine planning phase, but we provided key uh, government action on final inspection, inspections and decommissioning, relinquishment, and so on. I will go to my next slide, next and last slide here, just to show you a diagram that we have provided in the guidance document to help all stakeholders, governments, company, civil society, all interested stakeholders to understand the corresponding responsibilities between government and mining companies in the legal governance of an ESA process throughout the life cycle of the month. So you can see the color coded uh, that I discussed previously and corresponding actions that happen during the lifetime of the mine. We hope actually that this visual representation, we know that it's simplistic at some extent for those of you that are ESA experts and mining experts, but we nevertheless uh, hope that this will help you understand why we identify the good components and its corresponding government actions in the guidance document because it shows you the nature of mining operation and the technicality of ESA processes that call for a proper and adequate legal framework. So there's so much more that I can cover, but I, I will stop here. But please feel free to ask questions on topic covered in the guidance document, but, but which were not included in my presentation during our Q&A session. So over to you, Greg. Uh, thanks, Clemence, that was great. I, I just uh, wanna mention to all of the uh, participants that uh, we'll be making the, uh, the video available to, to everyone afterwards. We'll also uh, be able to provide the, the PowerPoint presentations if you're interested in, uh, in, in the material that we're, we're sending. So I'd like to hand it over now to, uh, to Paula to uh, provide updates on, uh, on the work that NCA uh, has done related to the guidance document, but just this, this topic uh, as well more generally. Paula? Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Greg. Um, dear all, well, thank you for joining this uh, webinar and thank you to IGF for inviting the NCA as one of the speakers based on our input during the elaboration of the guidance as one of the uh, peer reviewers. Um, we have seen a lot of interest and discussions within the mining sector around the world to make sure that it contributes to the development of a nation in a responsible manner. So you can also see in many countries like Burkina Faso uh, mining, or especially gold mining, uh, it is actually the main export product at the moment. So it has the main contribution to the national budgets. Next slide, please. So I will briefly um, explain who we are as uh, the Netherlands Committee of Environmental Assessments, um, the importance of this guidance and the role that we've played in this guidance. And um, I will pick out a few of our main findings. Next slide, please. Um, so the Netherlands, um, the NCA, I will call it from now on, um, it's an independent commission and we um, were put in place by our environmental legislation. Um, and we have a specific role here in the Netherlands and we have a different role in our development corporation. So within the Netherlands as a commission, we actually have a specific role to play and we have a regulatory role. So what we do, we actually check whether the ESIA process has actually been done correctly and we give an advice to um, the government whether the ESIA is sufficiently elaborated in order to make a formal decision. 
So we in in no manner or whatsoever do we have an opinion about the actual decision that will be made. So we have a very independent role to play. Um, so since the early 1990s, we also have an international uh, department which is financed for nearly 100% by our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And we are able to contribute to um, the ideas of our development corporation. And we actually collaborate with in a lot of the countries with the ministries of environment. So we see the ESA process as an important tool to show open and transparent decision making by government or governmental organizations. So this leads to responsible governance and will contribute to the sustainable development of a country and in the end to benefit the people. So in this role, we advise the governmental organization and uh, we can assist in, uh, for example, if they want to elaborate new legislation. Next slide, please. So the importance of this guidance. Um, yeah, for us, it, the reason why uh, we were very happy to get involved in this guidance is due to the importance and also the possible positive impact that it could have we believe this guidance makes a big difference seeing as it focuses on legal frameworks you know specifically um, there are already lots of guidances available about how to do an esia however not specifically aimed at uh, governmental organizations and how to improve their es their ES esia legal frameworks and, and within the mining sector so there are a few um specifics about the mining sector which are very interesting and obviously need to be taken into account during uh, this kind of process the life cycle of a mine from exploration operation to the aftermine closure can take many years or even generations so this is very different from for example doing an esaa for a new hospital or a new road construction so this makes it a very specific and very interesting um, procedure and also, um, you can maybe even say any mining activity is often contentious. So besides the great financial benefits for a nation, um, mining can also have long lasting negative impacts on a region um, if the environmental and social impacts are not managed in a responsible manner. Now, from our experience within ESIA legislation around the world, these specifics of the mining sector are not clearly dealt with. So which means that there is a lot of room for interpretation and what a proponent should or what they should not do. And also governmental organizations responsible for the ESIA are not sure either. So this leads to irresponsible decision-making or also a lot of confusion and a lot of uh, time uh, being spent on figuring out what they should do. So there is a clear need to align the national ESAA legislation and, um, um, and how to combine it with the decision-making process within the mining sector itself. So in order to assure that responsible management of the social and environmental impacts are actually dealt with. So the NCA envisage and hopes that this guidance will lead to close collaboration so this is, in the end, we're producing paper now, but it's all about how to improve collaboration between ministries, for example, the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Mining. Now, elaborating, for example, specific national guidelines together could be an interesting way to move this guidance forward. And this guidance could have a great contribution to initiating these kind of new initiatives. Next slide, please. Now, the role of the NCA, we played a role um, at the end of last year when during the first draft, we mainly um, had um, a lot of discussions about the balance between focusing on the legal frameworks, but then also, uh, also giving ideas about how to do a proper ESAA. So that was um, some of the main discussions uh, that we have. Um, and also, so how do you integrate uh, the legal frameworks that are existing within the ESAA and within the mining sector. Um, so our, our main advice at that point was to focus more 
on the opportunities to improve legal frameworks, um, which were taken on board. And um, we were very happy in March to receive a new version. Um, now I will soon go into some of our main findings. Now, one of the key aspects of uh, the commission is that we publish all of our work. So it's available to everyone. So also our independent advice that we elaborated can be found on the website. Um, and I've given the link in case anyone wants to read it after this webinar. Next slide, please. So um, we had more than three <laughs> observations, but I would just go into these three and I will actually concentrate on the first one in, our, in my next slide, but just to, to show you that um, we saw a lot of opportunities uh, within the exploration phase and we find this also a very interesting phase to, to discuss. Um, we also um, had quite some points on the public engagement and on transparency and access to information, which um, also I saw the IGF has done a great job on this aspect in the in the latest version. Um, so I will not go into the second part as much, seeing as the next speaker, Harriet, will go more into this point. Um, however, the NCA would like to emphasize that we see that ESAA legislation inclu includes public participation. Certain countries actually have within their ESAA legislation, they refer to public engagement legislation, which exists separately. Um, However, in practice, what, what you often see is that it's more about informing the public. So, especially at the stage of scoping, and sometimes um, the ESAA is made available for public consultation. However, this is very often a one-way communication line. So the public gives their input, but is rarely informed about what has been done with their input. So legal frameworks, frameworks could actually improve the situation by being more clear about what public engagement means and how it should be done. And this should be incorporated in the, into the ESIA legislation. So public engagement can actually greatly improve the quality of the ESIA process, but it can also lead to a much better relationship between the proponents and the surroundings of the mine. And it makes the government more reliable if the input from the public is taken seriously and in a visible manner during the ESA process. So public engagement, transparency and access to information, including, uh, including making the, the permits um, available and all the monitoring data and the reports, even after mine closure is in our opinion, very essential to this whole process. Now, the third observation about the importance of the ESSA, ESIA review and approval process within legal frameworks, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty um, clear, and I will not go into it separately um, as detailed as the exploration phase, but we would like to, like to emphasize that the ESIA process should prevent undesirable project segmentation and the need for full cumulative impact assessments, um, which is an obligation to carry out uh, within the ESIA of major projects. And also, if there are mo major project modifications, there should be a separate ESIA process. And obviously, for reviewing, there needs to be an appropriate reviewing time and capacity is available. For example, in Egypt, the reviewing time is 30 days. Now, for large mining projects, that's not enough. Next slide, please. So the exploration phase. Now you could discuss, you know, when should ESAA, a full ESAA be done during exploration or should it not be done? Uh, should you have a separate exploration license permits? Um, the, these are always interesting discussions. Um, so the decision making process within the mining sector is different to many other sectors. So whereas ESAA legislation is aimed to serve all sectors, um, so this has a very different uh, setup. So this, the, the decision to start exploration is something that is often not clearly taken into account in the ESAA, where they have categories A, B, and C um, within the ESAA legislation, but within the categories A, B, and C, um, it's not very clear where is exploration within the mining sector. 
So therefore there is confusion about this and often has led to exploration without any analysis of the possible environmental and social impacts. So the guidance gives an opportunity to align and improve this aspect. So most nations, they have minerals mapped out on the map and they have uh, like mapped it out in different courses um, in areas uh, for which proponents can get a license to explore or a license to research. Now the process of obtaining such a license to um, research is part of the mining decision making process. However, it is an important start to potential mining activities. So once the license to explore um, in a certain area is obtained, it is not clear in all countries whether an ESIA should be done or should not be done. So this is definitely something um, that needs to be looked at closely. So setting clear, you know, clear criteria for this within legal frameworks could help an important part in getting a clear understanding of the environmental and social impacts at a very early stage. This enables governments and project proponents to identify conflicting uh, land use and interests at an early stage and take the right decisions at an early stage. It is also a key, it is also key to implementing the principle of precaution and prevention, and it can assist in getting public engagement and transparency off to a good start right at the beginning. Next slide, please. Now, another thing that's, um, uh, that we discussed, and um, I'm very happy to see that on page 42 and 43 of the guidance, there is some ex more explanation about possible strategic environmental and social assessments for the mining sector. Because um, this could be also an opportunity to give solutions to some of the issues that we've already been talking about. So a strategic environmental assessment could already assist in making a national assessment of which potential mining areas are at a high, middle or low risk. So high risk could be due to the presence, for example, the Ramsar sites, important portable water sources, large cities, or even identify other conflicting governmental plans already in this area. So this strategic assessment could lead to clarify on whether or not exploration should even be carried out or whether um, for certain areas a full ESAA should be done. So strategic assessment could also set out strategic lines for responsible mining in the country. So what does it mean? This can assist the quality of the ESAA and makes the ESAA process faster and improve the quality the strategic environmental assessment should be carried out in an open, transparent and inclusive manner, including ministries, society at a national, regional and local level and the private sector, or well, everyone inclusive. So we were very happy, of course, that the guidance um, that IGF has taken up this point and included it in the guidance, as this could be a very interesting way to move forward on national planning level. Now, this is my last slide and um, I feel very strongly about this because um, obviously we have produced a great guidance and lots of paper, but now developing a guidance is all good and well, but in the end, um, we want to improve something in the field. So it can, this guidance can enhance how our knowledge and our capacities. However, it will only have any effects if we really do something with it. So reaching the sustainable development goals and implementing responsible mining and all is all about people. It's all about you and me. So, and it's all about the willingness to collaborate and work together. So if um, at least as, as uh, the commission, we would like to be, um, well, we, if there are people who are interested to looking at how to implement this guidance, for example, um, if there is a certain country that would like to look at the ESAA legislation and their mining decision making processes and legislation, and for example, would like to develop specific guidelines within their country to improve uh, this process, then we would be very happy to assist in uh, making this possible. So thank you very much for listening and I hope this information has given you some new insights and ideas and um, maybe we can discuss further during the Q&A.
Thank you very much, Bree. Okay. Uh, thanks, Paula. So next, uh, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Harriet to talk about uh, the work Transparency International uh, does in this area. Harriet? All right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Thank you, IGF, for the um, opportunity to participate in this um, important forum. Um, we were, you know, um, Transparency International um, participated as well in, in reviewing the document, and uh, we are happy it's now out. Um, so I'll just take um, some time to um, just give life to, you know, some of the aspects um, of, uh, you know, why transparency and access to information is important uh, within an ESA process um, and, uh, you know, how this leads to a better um, outcome in the mining processes. Um, so I'll talk a bit about Transparency International. Um, you know, Transparency International Kenya is um, one of the 20 uh, Transparency International chapters globally that are implementing a global project called Accountable Mining. Um, and it's uh, supported by the BHP Foundation and the Australia government through Department of uh, Foreign Trade. Um, so the program generally just focuses on strengthening transparency and accountability um, uh, to reduce the risks of corruption during uh, licensing and, and permitting um, licensing or awarding um, mining permits. Um, and you know we do this by conducting research um, and and engaging with relevant stakeholders uh, to improve integrity and the quality of decision making in the mining sector. So uh, and I can drop a link to a copy of the research that we've done, um, just highlighting key corruption risks. And, and one of them was obviously, um, you know, a risk that uh, the OPEC, uh, when, a trans uh, um, when the EIA process or the ESIA processes are OPEC, then of course there's room for, um, you know, corruption to creep in and, and uh, get, permits are handed out uh, where the community ends up getting hurt um, in the process. Um, and then of course, uh, environmental and social impact assessments and community co consultations of course are a key focus uh, for Transparency International uh, because if there are gaps in the process, um, then of course there's a risk that decisions to approve mining projects are not made in public interest. So you can, there are situations where, for example, the company uh, or and government would would collude, um, you know, to forward or to advance a project at the expense of um, of a community. So of course, um, you know, uh, um, for uh, next slide, please. So um, for the EIS uh, or the S, I keep calling them EIS. Uh, sorry, that's what uh, we call them in Kenya. So for the um, environmental and social impact assessment process to effectively identify, uh, re reduce, and manage the risk of uh, environmental and social harm from mining, uh, it needs to be transparent and prioritize access to to information. Um, and we need to look at um, we need to look at uh, transparency and access to information in two main ways. So one uh, about the steps and the requirement of the process. So who needs to do what when, and then secondly, uh, access to information um, in terms of what is produced after or as part of the ESA process. So here we are looking at the reports, the social environmental and social management plans. So it needs to be. Um, uh, you know, these two key aspects need to be uh, prioritized. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of access to information about these steps, um, so we need to think of uh, transparency. Um, we need to look at the, you know, procedural information and, and why it's important for, for this information, um, why it's, in, it's, it's important for the different stakeholder groups. So for companies, um, you know, they need to know the legal requirements of conducting an ASIA in, in a country because this differs from country to country. Um, and then the criteria, um, you know, the government will use to make a decision. Um, this also needs to be very clear. 
and then uh, which government department is responsible for what at what step. So for example, you'd have um, uh, an environmental management body that's, that's in charge of um, you know, approving uh, an, e uh, an ESI report. And then you'd, you'd have, uh, for example, a, mini a mining ministry that would ultimately use that report to issue uh, a permit. So it, it's important if all this information is clear for a company. And of course, the timelines um, for, for each of these steps, uh, it's very important for the company to know this. Um, and then, so then, you know, it reduces the ambiguity uh, of the process, um, you know, uh, and, and then it also, if, if that process is clear for companies, then it, again, it reduces the opportunity for um, companies or for government to, you know, or for government officials um, to create a situation where they're holding information uh, for and and then rent seeking um, to avail some of this information and then so having a clear objective and transparent process uh, is is fundamental um, in for good governance and integrity in a, a ESI legal framework uh, and then for the um, mining communities um, or the communities where this mining operation had taken place it's important for them to know um, you know when when they, um, they they have first they have a right to participate because it is their community it is their you know then their 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 land um, or their area that will be affected so they need to know they have a right to participate when to participate uh, who will be doing what consultations at what point will government come in at what point will the, um, the investor or the company come in? So the, this information needs to be very clear uh, and, being, and, and they need to know um, when the consultations will take place. And then you, um, so that, you know, if they, they can meaningf meaningfully participate in decisions um, that will profoundly, profoundly uh, impact their livelihood, their well-being, um, their human rights. Uh, some of these mining operations, if they'll end up displacing communities or, you know, and for, and for various parts of the world, Africa included, uh, people have this um, emotive attachment to, to land, its ancestral families have been there for quite a while, so they would need to know how a mining operation will affect uh, the fabric of what they've, they've held dear for, for quite for so long. And then, of course, for government, um, in, in some of these processes uh, Paula has, has spoken about, uh, the, the government needs to ensure that uh, the information, the process is clear and is transparent for all stakeholders, um, uh, of course, to make um, for, for a better outcome. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and of course, for, for civil society organizations, this is one of the key areas, um, you know, that the process, the transport, bringing, we, we come together to try and bridge this gap, information gap, because it happens quite a lot. So you'll find civil society organizations getting in there, you know, trying to simplify processes, um, you know, trying to go to communities and say there's a mining operation about to come in. So this is a process for ESIS. And we've had chapters that are currently doing this. Uh, our colleagues in South Africa uh, tried to simplify uh, some of these processes. Uh, for, um, and then the second part I've spoken about, you know, access to information uh, produced as part of the environmental and social impact assessment process. Uh, here again, we're looking at the reports, um, you know, um, looking at uh, how these reports, how um, uh, communities can access uh, the information uh, about obligations and conditions imposed on the company. So if a company has been given a green light to carry out uh, mining operations, then they're definitely their conditions and obligations that have been put on them. So it's important for this information to be easily accessible. Um, the environmental and social management plans, you know, again, it's very important for communities to be able to access this so they can monitor and enhance compliance. And particularly in situations where uh, the uh, environmental management bodies who are often in charge of enforcing this compliance sometimes are not centralized, sometimes are not available uh, locally or at the local level. So 
with communities having this information, they are able to um, enhance compliance on the part of the communities. And then, of course, if communities are aware of the potential risks and in impacts, um, potential risks and impacts of the mining operations, as I mentioned, it's, it's very important that then they have this information before beforehand so they're able to um, uh, look at how to start navigating or how to start uh, coexisting with these uh, mining operations uh, that will be taking place in, 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 their, in their localities. And these are simple things like if they're aware that there will be noise, um, there will be a certain level of noise in their neighborhoods or you know there'll be a lot of dust there are water suddenly the water that they used to access uh, you know will now have a, um, you know will, will be affected one way or another then they um, they are able to um, uh, you know, uh, either hold the company responsible for how they were told to manage that issue or they start um, adapting to, to these issues, making information uh, truly accessible. So, um, so for the second part, making, producing that, the, particularly information about the ESI processes. So one, we, we have to appreciate some of this information is truly technical um, and almost always it's in um, it's in the english language and for most of our communities where some of these operations take place uh, have varying um uh, levels of literacy uh, and language preferences so uh just making sure that the report is out there is not enough. It needs to be uh, simplified. It needs to be, you know, at the level in which communities can can understand. Uh, and then, of course, uh, most of the time, again, these reports are found at headquarters or, you know, at, at um, at big cities, uh, whereas the operations happen at community level. Um, so it's important that if uh, these reports are shared uh, for the communities at the local libraries, local community centers that they have, it's, it's good uh, for them to have copies of this. And then of course, um, ensuring um, informed and active particip uh, participation during consultations, uh, particularly from women and vulnerable groups, uh, because they are very, across the world, um, very defined gender roles. And more often than not, um, some of these operations will disrupt um, you know, way of life one way or another that will disproportionately affect men uh, and women differently. Um, there's this new economic activity coming to the ground. So for example, if there are more jobs for women than there are for men, that will skew a balance. And it's important for the uh, community to have this information uh, beforehand um, if, if it will affect how women, um, you know, carry out their duties, whether it is uh, their, their domestic chores, if they are affected one way or another, it's important that they, um, you know, they are aware of this and they are able to give their views, they're even able to input uh, this kind of information during the ASIA process. It makes for a, a, a richer or a well-informed process and it even helps um, government to make um, you know a proper decision about the um, uh, creating or awarding a permit uh, even for a company to know that this is how we are going to manage or uh, mitigate the, the effects you know after they've had all the in, uh, input from different um, stakeholders next slide please um, and of course um, uh, now that we are in this era, we, we, we've come to, um, we have to appreciate that the traditional way of, uh, of engagement or of sharing information is changing somewhat. Um, and, um, you know, and some operations are still going on despite uh, the current situation. So we have to appreciate what the new normal moving forward. Um, what that looks like. How do we ensure um, our communities are informed? Um, there's active participation in consultations, um, you know, at this time. Do we, for example, say that a company can do their consultations online? Can they, um, uh, 
put out the forms or you know um, information for communities to input if they do it online or they do it via a phone call would would that be considered a meaningful participation and we've seen this happening in colombia and peru in liberia the philippines the companies are now allowed to do this uh, esi process uh, consultations they're doing it online but how participatory is that what is the level of digital literacy uh, for the communities that are being engaged? You know, what the internet connectivity in this area. So again, we need to balance that out and see um, what that looks like in different contexts. And certainly now um, where there is pressure um, post COVID or whatever new normal uh, will be, you know, where economies are trying to get back on the ground and looking at um, mining is one of the key areas to put um, the economy back on its feet. How then do we ensure that um, we are still maintaining principles of transparency and accountability um, at a time when it is not necessarily possible um, to get um, to get on the ground and, and do the consultations. Um, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Asante. Thanks, Harry. Really appreciate it. Um, we're going to. I'm going to ask uh, Clemence just to provide a quick update on next steps for. Uh, for the IGF and, and the guidance document. And then uh, we're gonna open it up to uh, the questions. And so I'll hand it over to Kamal for uh, just kind of next steps for the IGF. Yes, I know that we are all impatient to start the interesting conversation. So I'm gonna be brief. Um, this webinar, as some of you might know, it's part of the series of activities uh, to launch the guidance document. We will be hosting in, in the fall, uh, a number of webinars in French and Spanish when we once we get their entire guidance document uh, translated into those languages but right now you will find that uh, we have a, a french executive summary version on our website uh, the spanish version will be uploaded by the end of this week if not next week um, at IGF, we always try to preach uh, to you know to practice what we preach so for us it's not enough to have a good and rich guidance document we want to implement it, as uh, Paula said. So we will dedicate uh, resources to support our member countries who wants to implement the guidance document through various forms of services. We will start by developing an online material tools available to members. And we will also continue our engagement with members to understand their needs to see how we can better support them with tailored services through technical assistance. So this is, what I can say for now, uh, but feel free to, to, to ask questions and tell us how we can better serve you. And also uh, any ideas and uh, opportunity for collaboration up, as Paolo mentioned. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Klaus. We'll move over to uh, kind of the Q&A part. And I'm just gonna, um, I'm just gonna read a couple uh, question comments that came in and then we'll, we'll open up to it to uh, broader discussion. So there's two, two that came in that are related to the exploration phase that uh, Paula was talking about, um, as well as kind of the early and the exploration phase of, of mining, but also the kind of early assessment phase of, um, of, uh, of kind of scoping. So for example, um, the question is, you know, how do you respond to claims that early assessment and ESA scoping simply extend the time and cost of preparing ESIA and, sc and securing project approvals and thus make a country less competitive? Um, you know, is it better to proceed directly to kind of the ESIA phase? And uh, another comment about kind of the cost associated with exploration uh, phase and, and how many projects uh, may go through exploration and not proceed to, to full uh, project development. So there, there's, uh, you know, we've got some comments related to kind of exploration and, um, and early assessment. And does that add time and cost? And does that make kind of a, a country uh, less competitive? Um, so I'm going to ask my, uh, my colleague Jennifer if she, um, Jennifer's got uh, uh, many decades of experience working, uh, not just as an ESIA specialist, but specifically in the mining sector. Um, so I'm going to ask Jennifer, um, to uh, see if she's got any, any thoughts on those comments. Sure, thanks, Greg. Uh, you can hear me? Yes. 
Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, yes, it, it can definitely be seen as costly um, doing ESIAs early um, for the exploration stage. And um, you'll see through the guidance really to take a uh, risk-based framework um, is really the important thing. Um, if you can set up a legal framework that uh, has the early or, or standard terms and conditions for early exploration, um, but as the exploration goes on, more impacts are potential, potentially there. And if you take a, a risk-based framework, then you can um, have the standard conditions and then do a, a semi-detailed, what is provided in the guidance as a semi-detailed impact assessment. So it can be a smaller one. It doesn't have to be full-blown. So you can scale it and, and minimize the cost that way. Um, also, as Paula was mentioning, doing um, your land use planning and your strategic use uh, environmental assessment, strategic planning early is important as well because then you can manage some of the um, expectations of the mining companies and and of the government uh, early to minimize those costs um, and manage the expectations so that the impacts are minimized along the way and everybody knows what to expect going forward. Um, so it doesn't necessarily make a country less competitive. Um, what it can do if you set up the framework properly uh, or effectively is set up expectations for the companies and actually make it more um, more attractive to investors uh, to come and mining companies to come into the country because they know what to expect. Um, and so it actually is, is more competitive to have a strong ESIA framework that manages it at a risk-based and ESIA based framework. Does that anybody want to answer or add anything to that? No, Paula, Harriet, no? Paula, maybe? She want to react? I think I think Jennifer said it uh, very well. I think in the end, um, I think in the end, if you're very clear on if the legal frameworks are very clear, then you become, you could become even more competitive. Um, in the end, you don't want to take very quick decisions and then uh, ten or twenty years down the line um, have irreversible negative impacts in your nation. So uh, I think there's many ways of making the procedure more simple and clear. Um, in, in such a way and that, that's why this is so interesting because this is the legal framework so you can actually uh, with this guidance uh, improve these aspects and then you can you can become much more professional much faster uh, much more reliable and it's and like Jennifer said it's all about expectations so um, yes I think I mean you also have to realize um, a lot of the people who might be buying or organizing uh, the license to research um, Often they will sell it on if if it's uh, if it shows that it has a lot of minerals, um, and then you you move on to another proponent. So I think also in that respect, it, it's very good if these kind of things are kind of um, well elaborated, um, and because also that should environmental social impact assessment should also be taken into account when selling on the license. Um, it's all and then again, it's all about managing expectations. Um, on what, what is to come. Great. Thanks. I've got, uh, I've got a question uh, for you, Paula. Yeah. yeah. At what level of decision making, sorry, my screen just bounced. At what level of decision making could the guidelines be implemented in the countries and by who? Can the comment, or sorry, can you comment on the importance of making some of the guide, guidance legally bound? Well, exactly. I mean, the, the, the guidance is actually, it's a guidance for, for any nation. So that makes it uh, maybe a little bit more generic. Um, obviously, each country has its own ESAA legislation and its own mining uh, uh, legislation or procedures. But this guidance gives an opportunity to, for, for these, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of stakeholders involved, but especially on the legal side, it would be great if uh, ministries of environment and ministries of mining uh, would really closely collaborate um, and make sure that they are both um, aligned on what the procedures sh should be in the country. So I think this guidance gives an opportunity to take your ESA legislation, take the mining 
legislation and procedures and, and look at how you could improve and maybe come to a formal agreement based, based on that. Um, and then you, you know, it helps the whole implementation. So this is a guidance and then you could move towards guidelines, which is, could be maybe actually approved uh, and agreed upon. Uh, and then you can more easily move forward. Yeah, thanks, Paula. We, we, we see that in a lot of countries where you know they they have their broader ESA legislation of, that applies across all sectors, and they often uh, develop guidelines specific to individual sectors, including the mining sector, which can address kind of the the, mall, the, the full mine life cycle uh, issues associated with mining that other sectors don't necessarily have. Mine closure, as as you mentioned earlier, so. Um, you know, taking this guidance and, and helping countries develop into guidelines is something that, that could definitely be a, a good outcome. Uh, Jennifer, do you have anything to add to this? Um, just that it's a, it's a guidance, so it's, you don't want to make these guidelines legally bound, I'm not sure, but um, definitely bringing those in, into the consideration. I don't I, I, nothing else to add though. Okay. So we have another we have another question. Uh, has the IGF already received requests from member states as a reaction to the to the guidance discussed today? As I, as I mentioned, we we had a quite a robust um, process to develop the the guidance document. We've had some dialogue with members uh, in terms of developing the guidance document itself. Um, at our upcoming annual general meeting in October, we'll we'll talk to governments in more detail. But uh, I'll ask my colleague Clemence if she has. Uh, Anything to add to that? Thank you, Greg. Um, as, as you mentioned, we have had a lot of engagement with our members throughout the process. There have been some interest since we launched the guidance document to understand first and digest, digest all the information that we have in this guidance document. But there's a number of countries that are already that reach out to, to inform us about what they're planning to undertake in terms of uh, revising their ESA processes in their jurisdictions and inquiring on how the IGF uh, can support them. So there's a couple of countries that, uh, that uh, as in the same view of wanting the IGF to support them uh, down the line when they get ready to this phase. Yeah. But we just launched the guidance document three weeks ago and we is not available yet to all languages and we have a number of member states that are francophones and spanish speakers and waiting to understand first uh what kind of recommendation we have in the guidance document thank you All right, thanks so here's a here's a here's a question for uh open open to all that's a good question what happens if local communities or environmental groups don't agree with the way the esia is carried out and or the results of the ESIA. Does the guidance include a complaint mechanism or a feedback loop? So, uh, commence, uh, it, it, it feeds into the transparency and, and you did mention, uh, you know, as earlier on that, that uh, grievance mechanisms was one of the uh, kind of 10 elements of the, of the legal framework. Uh, do yes. you want to just mention the, kind of the grievance part of the, the framework? Uh, yes, uh, you already alluded to it. Uh, in our 20 points uh, component of the comprehensive legal frameworks, uh, we do identify um, grievance mechanism, the availability of grievance mechanism to communities to voice their complaints and concerns uh, with regard to a mining project, but not only to voice the complaints, but also to have uh, a response uh, back to the complaints that they're voicing. Uh, throughout the guidance document, uh, one of the elements that we have highlighted is that in some instances there's misunderstanding from stakeholders, including from communities, about how a mining project works. So uh, building, that's why we insisted in building uh, community capacity building uh, capacities to be able to understand, have a meaningful consultation and understand and voice their concern based on uh, the realities of mining projects. So it's uh, as uh, Ariet mentioned, uh, it, there's a lot of emotional reactions to some of mining projects because it's happened in you know traditional lands and with a lot of a um, uh, lot of uh, attachment. But helping community, and this is the, also one of their uh, 
uh, one, of, one of the tasks of uh, government to help their community understand and engage uh, with mining companies to find a common understanding, a grounds for uh, the pursuit of a mining project. Thank you. Thanks. Here's, a, here's a, another interesting question. Is it recommended practice that the regulator use peer, review, peer reviews to support project evaluation, for example, in technically complex cases? Maybe I'll uh, ask uh, Paula to jump in first. Like, do you, does NCAA um, see many countries with requirements for peer review? Uh, when, when NCAA is asked to, to play that role, is that, uh, is that because the country has a, a requirement for that? Or is that kind of, or is that often just done for individual projects? Yeah, and what we see is that in, in uh, certain countries, it's not actually explicitly mentioned in the legislation. Um, in some countries, they consider peer review as being, uh, even as if the environmental agency doesn't have enough capacity, so they hire someone else to do their review for them. But that's obviously not the same. Um, in best practice, um, it is definitely uh, something that is, um, it's part of best practice to have third party um, reviewing. So um, yeah, it depends on the, on, on the current situation of the legislation in each country. And, and I mean, we can practically say that each country around the world has ESAA legislation and there's still a lot of room for improvements. Um, and as a commission in the Netherlands, we, we have a specific mandate, um, but uh, as I understand, we're the only country that has a commission like our commission, uh, who plays an important role in the Netherlands. Um, but the only thing we do is just um, advise the government on whether the process was done according to our legislation, yes or no. Um, so that's, that's still, in many countries, there's still a, a pr yeah, room for improvement on that aspect. Yeah, I think it's definitely good practice. Uh, my experience is, uh, I don't know many jurisdictions or, or governments that, that have that as a requirement. Um, you, you, you sometimes see that for, uh, in, some, in some countries, for very large complex projects. You know, there may be a panel review, like, like a, a dedicated panel review uh, that may require some independent um, uh, studies done, but it's generally, um, I would say, not as common and, and more limited to very specific projects and, and not kind of broad based. So a uh, question that just came in, according to the review of best practices, at what stage of the ESIA process is better to do uh, consult prior consultation? So maybe I'll hand that over to, to Harriet. So in terms of the kind of transparency and, and uh, consultation in, in the process within the life cycle of, of a mine, um, what, what, is the, what is the right stage for, uh, for consultations to, to start? Uh, we've had conversations, like earlier we were talking about exploration, um, you know, with, with mine and, and a number of mining uh, explorations uh, don't go forward. Um, some do and some don't. Um, so where, where, you know, is there a right time for consultation or is it really based on kind of the individual aspects of, of each mining development? Um, I, would, I would say individual aspects um, of, of each project, but um, at the exploration stage would definitely give you more information, um, you know, and more insights on where the community is at at any one time. Uh, we've had projects that uh, have completely stalled because the community, uh, you know, rebelled um, completely against a project. Certainly here in Kenya, projects stalled for over 10 years uh, because the community just came out strongly and said, you cannot, um, we've, you may have been given a license, but we will not allow you to do this simply because they were not involved in the, in the, in the first place. So as 
early as possible. Um, and I understand, uh, you know, there was a question about cost considerations for the exploration stage. Um, but if, you know, whatever the legal requirements of a country uh, spell out, yes, but uh, as a bit pr best practice, I, I would say, you know, going as early as possible, um, even if not full scale, just trying to get, um, you know, insights from community and then uh, move it from there. Great. Th thanks, Harriet. I want to just uh, come back to you. You mentioned in your uh, presentation around COVID-19 and um, kind of the challenges of, of what the new normal looks like. Has Transparency International seen any, it's early, but have you seen any trends in terms of governments moving consultations online to try to speed up kind of the approval process? For example, you mentioned mining being an important economic driver in many countries, and that'll be part of the um, economic uh, rebound um, uh, for countries. Um, are, you, are you seeing any countries that, that have started requiring consultations to be moved online or see any trends you've seen so far? Um, yes, um, actually just mentioned it briefly. So we've seen um, Colombia, Peru, Liberia, and the Philippines. They're actually allowing companies to do these consultations online. So it's something that's already coming up and we are afraid that, you know, uh, if this continues, then there's a huge chunk of the population that will be left out um, because they are not able to effectively uh, participate either because they don't have internet connectivity or you know the digital literacy as i've mentioned so this is something definitely um, that we are looking to see how then do we still uh, enable our communities to participate in this process or how can we as civil society engage government to make the consultations more participatory, even in this situation uh, we are in. It's a huge, it's definitely a, a, it's definitely a huge challenge, absolutely. Um, I'm going to uh, direct this question to, to Clemence. Uh, are there any recommendations in the guidance document uh, to prevent large scale mining companies to have double standards? For example, when the ESIA regulatory framework in the host country is lacking, the company should apply the best practices standards applied in the, in the home country. I guess that means the, the home country of, of the mining company in an international mining country uh, um, situation. So uh, do you want to just mention kind of the um, uh, kind of when developing legal frameworks, um, kind of taking in, into account kind of international good practice? Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you. I've, this is an interesting question. It's a challenging one. Uh, there's have been a lot of discussion about the, the extraterritoriality of, you know, laws yeah. from the company, uh, the host, uh, the national uh, uh, company where the company is incorporated. How this can be uh, um, actually uh, translated, transposed in the host country. It's not an easy, there's not an easy answer, but uh, it's important to mention that most companies through either their, uh, their code of conduct or through their association also have developed some guidelines. And as we mentioned in the guidance document, in some instances, they go beyond uh, national government, host government uh, requirements in uh, in ESAA and so environment and social protections in general. So I, uh, from our experience and consultation, a lot of companies are really uh, interested, not only in respecting countries' uh, uh, environmental and legal requirement, but also uh, uh, implementing best practices uh, through their own uh, instrument, but also through lender requirements, for example. Uh, projects require, and financing, finance require uh, government uh, companies actually to, 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 to have a certain conduct and attitude with regard to the operation, their operations. So they're really keen in implementing uh, these best practices. And dialogue is always important when you realize that uh, there's a shortcoming in your legal frameworks to sit down at the table and have a conversation and dialogue with the company to see how uh, some of these uh, uh, protections uh, and uh, activities can be done in the safer way for communities 
and uh, while uh, allowing the operations to continue. All right, thanks, Klaus. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to you again here with another one. It's it's asking about uh, now that the guidance document is has been developed. What what next? Uh, you mentioned earlier um, some of the webinars that that are happening. Uh, yes. So what's what's the next step for governments, and what is the role of the IGF to make the guidelines a reality in actual country frameworks? So how do we What's the, what's the role of the IGF to move it from a guidance document to uh, um, in practice? So, so governments are actually implementing this good practice. Uh, is there, it says, is, is there scope for IGF or any of the other partners in, in the development of the guidelines to conduct research or appraisal of national policy frameworks to inform their next steps or inform national advocacy towards relevant uh, reforms. So uh, not just what can the IGF do, but um, other uh, IGF and its partners can help uh, conduct kind of almost a gap analysis on that national frameworks uh, to identify what the gaps are and, and how to address them. Yes. Uh, you, you already provided some insights on <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question, the response. As, as we mentioned, uh, right now we're working on translating the guidance document in Spanish and French and uh, to, to ensure the broader accessibility to the document. Uh, but the concrete next step, as we did with our previous guidance document, is to work with governments and to see how we can better support them. Uh, the way IGF works, uh, we, we really um, support our country's uh, member government based on their needs through various services. So as we mentioned, we will be developing online tool material, but also um, like we did in previous government document, we have collaboration. We will inquire and look for collaborations to see uh, what we can do to support our members. So uh, the guidance document, for example, uh, invite governments to undertake a gap analysis. We have provided a list of uh, checklists. So we will be certainly uh, looking into uh, developing in which way we can develop a self-assessment tools, for example, to country or in which situation we can partner with organization. We have a chance of uh, having NCA, CFE, and IIA, which are really a network of experts in the area, uh, uh, support us in the process to see what we can do together to uh, support members. So it's early in the process, but you will hear from us in the coming months about uh, different type of activities that are available to members and other interested stakeholders. Okay. Uh, thanks, Clemence. So, uh, uh, definitely answers the question. Um, and, and, and for those on the call, stay tuned. There's going to be a lot of uh, work that, that the IGF is, is, will be implementing in this, in this area, as Clemence mentioned, online training uh, modules. And, and uh, Paula mentioned uh, in, her, in her comments that the, you know, the importance of this guidance is it really fills a gap and it focuses on you know, how to improve the actual legal frameworks for ESIA in, in the mining sector. And, and there really, isn't, there really um, has not been any guidance specifically in this area uh, to date. And so this is uh, the, why this government, this guidance document was created and, and why it's important. So we're uh, closing up, uh, we're, we're coming close to the end of our time. So I just wanted to uh, provide, any, um, provide an opportunity for any of the panelists, if, if you have any final comments before we, uh, before we sign off. So um, we'll go in the same order. Uh, Clemence, is there anything uh, you wanted to mention? I, I want to thank our uh, invited panelists and all participants uh, for um, the interesting discussions. We will be sharing uh, the presentation and the recording of this guidance document, including additional information about next steps. Great. Thank Excellent, thanks. Uh, Paula, is there anything on your side? Um, and I just wanna thank everyone who uh, participated and um, well, we can't wait to put theory into practice. That's uh, yeah. where we play our role. So uh, looking forward to our next steps. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, thanks again for NCA's participation in the process and for um, um, you know, your reference to the work that NCA can do going forward in, in, in making this a reality in, in countries. And we're, we're excited to work with uh, 
um, to work with our members and, and also hopefully with NCA on this uh, in a, with our member countries. Uh, Harriet, over to you. Is there anything uh, you wanted to close out on? Um, first is to say that, um, um, of course, it's a great job that IGF has done to, uh, to create this guidance document. And even for civil society organizations, it's a document that we can go to government with and say this, um, you know, this is where weaknesses in our ESIA processes are. Uh, how can we work together to strengthen them, you know, just based on this document alone and, uh, you know, and with a network of, uh, um, you know, the chapters that we work with in Transparency International and definitely other civil society organizations working in the mining and extractive sector. It's definitely um, a, a very important document to advance um, that agenda. And of course, uh, thank you for um, to IGF for having us be part of this and for everybody um, in participating in this session. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. We really appreciate Transparency International's uh, work uh, with us on the guidance document. Uh, your colleague Lisa has been very, very uh, instrumental in, in working um, in the mining sector and the work Transparency International is doing. So we, uh, we really enjoyed it and, and thank you very much. So that, that, uh, that concludes our, our webinar. I really appreciate everyone uh, taking the time to, to join us today. And as Clemence mentioned, our guidance document is on, on our website. Uh, the executive summary is translated into French. Uh, our Spanish is coming uh, close uh, soon this week or next, and the full guidance document will be translated into English and Spanish as well. We look forward to seeing you soon, and uh, thank everybody for joining. Really appreciate it.